Over the next nine weeks, we are going to look in depth at the Ten Commandments. If you are like most people today, they would say that they would believe in the Ten Commandments, or at least some of them. Others might say that such commandments were given to an antiquated people in an antiquated time. And even some may say they're just nothing but a, a set of burdensome rules that we have to keep. That they're nothing more than thou shalt not. Now let me say nothing can be further from the truth. In this sermon series, we are going to truly explore the relevance of those powerful and ancient words in our lives today. We will discover that these words are guideposts and guardrails that can help each and every one of us live a faithful life to God and to one another. The Ten Commandments became and still is the foundation of Judaism, but it's also the foundation of Muslim belief and as us as Christians. And the truth of the matter is that these commandments given by God to the people of Israel is the foundation upon which the gospel itself rests. So let's take a journey to discover the power of these commandments in our lives today. And we're going to look at those, those commandments, not only from the, the, the eyes of the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures, I should say, but we are going to look at it from, through the eyes of Christ, how Jesus saw the commandments and applied them to the gospel living. We're going to focus this morning on the first two commandments. Both are intertwined. This is what the Hebrew scriptures tell us, that God said all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor in any likeness, or anything in the heavens above or on the earth below, or anything under the water and under the earth. Before listing any of the commandments, God really wanted to remind Israel that he alone freed them from slavery, that God alone freed them from the bondage of Pharaoh. The commandments were not a way to earn God's favor. Rather, the giving of the laws presumed that there is a mutual love, a mutual respect, loyalty that has been established between Israel and God. The Ten Commandments come to Israel after God redeems Israel from Egypt. And it's there on Mount Sinai that he establishes a, a new covenant with the people of Israel that extends all the way to Christ, where Jesus takes these same commandments and gives life, new life to them where they're just not a set of empty rules or something written on parchment, but that these laws are forever etched in one's heart. It becomes a way of life, a way of living. We don't do it, we don't follow these laws in order to prevent God from being mad at us. But we take in and live out these laws, again, as a way to show our love our love for God, and our love for one another. It's an extension of this sacred relationship we have with the divine. So the first thing I like to do is look at the name of God. God does have a name, but what's really interesting 
is that this name is so holy that throughout Scripture, they replace it with another word. Now, the word for God used by the people of Israel is Yahweh. Yahweh is actually mentioned over six Uh, 6,800 times in the Hebrew scriptures, more than any other word. But because Yahweh, which means I am, is so holy to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people, that throughout scripture it has been replaced with the word Adonai, which translates as Lord. So anytime you read the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and you see the word Lord, it is actually using God's name, Yahweh. Again, Yahweh is translated as, I am that I am. It is linked, this word, this this name of God is linked really literally to all that has been created because God is the source of all being. God is the source of all life. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I want to show you a video that, that to me describes the nature of God as creator. You're going to see two images. One of the deep field uh, uh, photograph that was taken by the Hubble spacecraft where they find one black uh, area of space and then they just magnify it to its greatest extent. And you go back billions of years back into time. And you see the majesty of God in the galaxies and in the stars. And the next picture is that of of a carbon atom. And and that God is present in the, the grand scheme of the universe as well as in the quantum physics of an atom, of a quark. So when God says, I am, God's speaking about it. He is all that encompasses life, and God is all that encompasses our life and the life of humanity and all of creation. We also want to first understand that our response to God when we recognize in humility that we're part of God's creative hand, we are left in a place of humility. Humility is something that we're not very good as human beings, right? We kind of like to be the center of attention rather than God. We kind of like to pat ourselves on the shoulder and say, well done, good and faithful servant, when it's really God who's been doing the work all along. So when we humble ourselves before God, the Lord of creation, we recognize in humility our place. But yet, even within being in that very small, minuscule place, as it relates to all of creation, God says, you know what, you're still blessed. I know every hair that's upon your head. I want to share in your life. I want to share in your hopes and dreams. That's the majesty of God. That he is both transcendent and he lives also in each one of our hearts. Now, I'm a science geek. I, I really am. I'm, uh, I, I love studying the earth. the the stars. I love astronomy as well as geology because I believe that through science it draws us closer to the truth about God. 
And it really does humble us. I want to play for you right now. Uh, many of us have heard Carl Sagan. And when the Voyager system was, I think, way out by, uh, by Neptune, or actually maybe Saturn, I should say, they focused its camera upon where the Earth was, and there was this pale blue dot. This pale blue dot, which is our home in the midst of the cosmos. Let us listen to what Carl Sagan, what he wrote in response to that very spiritual moment. 